Hello, my name is Professor Welch. I'm a professor in computer science at Central Texas College. And I wanted to take a, a bit of time and have a discussion with you on why you might want to major in computing or what some of the landscape factors are that you'd be, you'd be interested in knowing about that would shape your decisions. So we'll have a conversation here for probably the next 15 or 20 minutes. And what I'd ask you to do is use this as a discussion and not as a presentation. So you all have a chat box available to you. If there's something that comes up, whether it's whether I'm talking about it or I'm missing it, please let me know. And multiple questions are fine. You don't need to wait till the end of the presentation to, to ask your question. And it's not just the topic of computing, but the other topics that I wanna make sure that are addressed or are, how do I know which classes to take or what will classes be like in the fall? So please make this a discussion and I look forward to having the conversations with you. So let's talk about why computing. Now you know as well as I do that computers are everywhere. And we could probably say 10 years ago they were everywhere and be relatively accurate, but we're, we are overwhelmed by the presence of computing in our world. And I put a couple of snaps up on the screen to indicate where they are, and I'll step through them pretty quickly. Now we're in COVID at this time, and during our period in COVID, the entire industrialized economies of the world have become very dependent on network connectivity for things that you see here. So in the upper left, you see e-commerce. One of the things I want you to know is when you shop online, that, that clearly is a networked activity. But in the back end, where the, the logistics of the stores are being filled by the manufacturers and the distribution, that's also a networked activity. And it's pretty amazing when you realize when you pick something up off the shelves at Walmart and you step through the, the, uh, the checkout line and the scan, when you scan that, there's a buy signal that goes through the entire system all the way to wherever that, that um, item is produced. The second thing I'll speak to is this business of self-driving cars. Now, we're not really in a position of self-driving cars right now, but we, but we are in a position of smart cars. And smart cars are tremendous because small insertions of sensors in your car can make your car measurably safer. You know, we have, unfortunately, we have people that are doing distracted driving because of their mobile devices and a car can be much, much safer. And then as you go, as you look on the screen here, I could put 50, 60, 80, 100 snaps on uh, areas of computing that infiltrate our lives. And that's something that we need to manage. It's mostly to the good, um, but it's something that we need to be aware of. It, it represents tremendous potential. Now in the lower right, just as a, as a curiosity, in the lower right, you can see an instrumented cockpit for one of our airliners. And the interesting thing is when you take an airline flight, um, typically the pilots are in active control of the controls, the uh, flight systems, flight control systems for the, for the early part of the flight and the later part of the flight. But for the entire rest of the flight, it's the automatic flight control system that's taking control. So. So when you're, in, when you're in, in route to your destination, your pilots are sitting up there drinking their coffee and watching the computer fly. So obviously computer is, computing is essential to everything that we do. And one of the things I want you to think about after this presentation is we don't do computing to do computing. We do computing because it's a powerful enabler to anything else that we want to do. And that's those are areas that are listed on the left-hand side. So computing gives you the power to influence its scale. What I tell some of my students is, if you wanna help one person major in sociology or a group of people major in sociology, it's a fascinating field. If you wanna bring healthcare or social resources available to an entire city of underprivileged or under-resourced population, major in computing because computing will allow you to develop systems that will support delivery of food, delivery of money to, to large parts of the population. So we have the, the areas over on the left-hand side. Obviously, I want you to take computing classes and I want you to major in a computing degree. But no matter what degree you're going to be in in this day and time, there will be a large component of knowing about computing in healthcare, in education and training. As you can see right now, my method of delivery to you is through a networked environment that permits me to talk to you, present lessons, present labs, and that's that's done through computing. So think of computing as really, it's not just a field, it's a pervasive capability that you wanna to bring to the table when you're working in your selected field.
So as an example, we talked a little bit about there's two advanced aircraft that we see here. Over on the left-hand side is Boeing's, used to be the newest aircraft. It's the second newest aircraft. It's their 787. And on the right-hand side, you see the, uh, the F-35, which is, what, which is the military's newest um, fighter. So those aircraft are computers. They're a flying network of computers that just happen to be in, you know, in, a, in an air vehicle system. And when we start talking about building some of these advanced technologies now, we really start with the computing first and the airfoil and the, air, the aircraft performance second. So computing certainly influences the design and the use of aircraft. Now we're talking about, we're in an era now where we're trying to manage our energy systems to be more, um, to, to make less of a footprint on the environment. And every country, every industrialized country has made a lot of progress. But if we're gonna move forward down this path to alternative energy or green energy, then we need computing to provide the delivery of energy to your house at the right time. Now, if you look at the picture in the upper right, that's the that's the the energy distribution system for the United States. I want you to look at that picture and think not about bits and networking of bits and information. I want you to think about energy and the networking of power around the United States. So there are energy control systems that manage that. And an example would be is let's say we're in the middle of summer now. Let's say it gets very, very hot in Texas or very, very hot in Arizona, and they need more energy capacity there, it will be a computer that decides which plant provides that energy capacity to that city or to that region. And that used to be human, managed by humans now. It's not, it's not now. It's almost entirely managed by computing. So if you, want to, if you want to make impact at scale, then learn how to write computer programs that will facilitate the distribution of energy in a, in a low footprint environment. So just a little little discussion about the internet. I want to I want to point point out a couple things to you. Uh, we take this for granted now, and it was real. It's really interesting when you go back and you look at the history of the internet. Is the people that designed the internet in no way foresaw the penetration and the use and the and the busyness of networking as we see it now. They they just didn't envision it. I think when they built the first network, there were eight devices. Think about that for a second. Eight devices on the network. So this, this underlying infrastructure that really powers, it powers the world now, it, it innervates the world, um, it's, it's not managed by any, U, any national entity, it's not managed by any company, it's just an amalgamation of, frankly, ad hoc networks. And we take it for granted. So what are we doing right now? Well, I'm not at the college right now, I'm at home giving this presentation to you. So I'm at the home network, if you see the home network here, and my, my video, my encoded video is going from my, from my computer, in this case a, a desktop, through my access point, through my router, out through the internet, up to the global ISP, and then down to the in institutional internet, which is what we have at, at uh, Central Texas College. And we take this for granted now. We also take it for granted that when you're mobile and you have your mobile devices, um, wherever you are, virtually wherever you are in the United States, you have access to this internet through your mobile device. So all the things that you see here is the world of computing. Every device there, every, every node that you see there, those are all running little computer programs that make this all work. Computing allows you to have impact at scale. So if you look at this and you realize the scale of this and then the worldwide characteristics of it, Computing allows you to have impact at scale. And all computing is not writing software and all computing is networking, is not networking, but, but those, are, those are skill set areas that you might want to investigate for, for computing. So I want, to put a, I want to put a couple of definitions in your nomenclature as a result of this presentation that we have, because I think it, it matters to your degree plans it certainly matters to, the, to your normal behavior. So we have this, this concept out there called the Internet of Things. And that's where computing is now. And that's why I want to speak to you on this topic right here. The old days, and I consider the old days, before three years ago or before four years ago, that's when we talked about computing. We really talked about desktops and laptops and some mobile devices, maybe iPads or phones. 
So, so consider before 2016, 2015, that was, I can't believe I'm saying this, that was legacy. And what we have right now is we have an explosion of really what, what I consider to be the new internet. And that's the internet of things. And it's where we network every single little thing that, that benefits from and some intelligence in it. So I want you to look at the chart here. You know, all charts tell stories. All graphs have, have a story behind them. If you look at that chart, and you follow that chart along the bottom where it says the year, and you can barely pick out the years of 2012 and 2014, and then notice the way that line goes from, frankly, sort of a, a horizontal line to an almost vertical line. So when you're observing phenomena, if you see a vertical line, then in some way jump on it because that shows that there's that the degree of change is changing, which represents promise and opportunity. So if you notice, we went from approximately five billion devices, which were which represent laptops and PCs, to fifty billion devices, which represents a forty-five billion device increase, which represents the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things that you see in the pictures there, that you can see checking into a hotel, you can see the power distribution, you can see the the air conditioning and monitoring at your house. You can see the uh, the uh, traffic lights. You can see the electric toothbrushes. Now, some of these are sort of whimsical and maybe not not they don't have a lot of gravitas. But some of these are 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 essential to the fabric of our society today. So when you hear the term Internet of Things, that's what we're talking about. And computing today is a large degree to the Internet of Things. And it comes down to how creative are you? What can you think about? And if you can imagine it today, you can build it. So here's an example of Internet of Things that I think is just is incredible. So there's a phenomena, an unfortunate phenomena in in um, you know postnatal development called sudden infant death, and it's where the baby, for some reason, it's unpredictable and unknown that the baby may stop breathing, and it can cause it can cause you know it can cause death. So they have these monitors that they put on high risk babies, and this is one of them. And you can see that monitor there it represents there's a there's electronic two electronic strips that re represent sensors to the baby's breathing and the baby's heart rate. And that little bulb at the bottom is a balloon. So so that monitor right there will talk to a device that for high risk babies, so the parents can monitor the baby and also the hospital can monitor the baby. And if the baby does evidence is some problems, that little bulb will inflate and it'll, it'll come up like a balloon and it'll shake the baby and the baby will wake up. And that's really all you need. That's what you need for to prevent, prevent such a, a bad outcome. So this little device right here that, can, that you can make nowadays, you can make it on your own, that little device has saved over 4,000 babies. So that's an example of the Internet of Things. And you know, like I said, what can you imagine? What can you create? And you can do it with all the devices that we have available now. So here, what I, this, this diagram is a busy diagram. I want you to focus on two things, and I'll, and I'll talk you through it. The first diagram is the circle on the left. It's the pie chart. And what that represents is the amount of jobs in STEM that are computing. So, so everybody hears this emphasis on STEM, which is probably appropriate if you want to be a, you know, an, an engineer, you want to be a scientist. If you have 100 jobs in STEM, 73 of them will be in computing. So that's a massive penetration of computing or reliance on computing for STEM, STEM fields and STEM industries. What that shows is a mandate for our educational systems that we need to react to to be able to support um, the growth of our economy, the opportunities of our population. So that's that's what that is. So when you hear STEM, think computing. On the right hand side, the reason that I, I think that chart is useful on the right hand side is there's a perception in computing that it's all programming. That if you're a computing a computer scientist or you work in computing, that you're a programmer, and that's not true. You can say that almost everybody in computing needs to know a little bit about programming. But the people in computing that, that solely focus on programming, which is cool, which is awesome, are software developers. The remainder of jobs in computing require some programming, maybe a little bit, maybe a lot, but they really focus on other areas. Um, so the reason I wanted to say that is there's, there's this perception that, you know, when I'm, when I'm a computer science major, I'm a computing major, all I do is head down on the computer. And that's, that's not true. Uh, you, spend, you spend most of your time engaged with your team. You spend most of the time 
engage with your customer. And by far, the best skill set you can bring to the table if you want to work in computer science or computing is communication skills and analytical skills. I had a president of a company uh, talk to me about the people that he had hired from our college, and he said, you know what? I'm happy if they know a little bit about computing, but we can teach them. We can refine their computing skills. What we rely on is their ability to communicate with the customer and solve problems. So think about that as you move through your development. So over on the right-hand side, you see areas of computing. So we have software developers, about 30%, computing support, database administrators, network systems administrators, information security, and web developers. So as you think about what do I want to do in computing, Figure out what slot in here you might be interested in. And your slot isn't fixed over time. You certainly can switch. You can start off as a network systems administrator. You can move to a database administrator. You can move to the software developer. So, so when we say computing, we, we're talking about that range of fields that's represented by this list here. Okay, I want to speak to security a little bit because we have a new degree program at Central Texas College called Information Assurance and Cyber Defense. And, it, and it's about security. So the, because the entire world now relies on networking and computers, well, there's bad people in the world that now have access to the network and computers. And that's what the cybersecurity program at CTC protects against. So let's look at this as an example. So I have a couple of use cases here and the use case means it's an example. So one of the roles of computer security is to prevent hijacked people. So we have an example that the nice lady that, that as you, as you see in this in the snap in the bottom right, is doing her banking. Well, a hacker set up a wireless access point that's not a real one, it's a pretend one, but it looks just like a real one. And when she types into her information on her bank site, the hijacker will hijack her session. Now the hacker has access to her bank accounts, he can exfiltrate the money as he thinks useful. So one of the things that we wanna do in computer security are prevent is prevent this situation. Another situation, another use case in computer security is to prevent ransom companies. Perhaps you've heard the term ransomware. And ransomware is where I am able to in, induce you to download a little piece of malicious software. Now you may not know that you downloaded it. It may just be, go, you can just go to an, a malicious site just by the fact that you load that malicious site, you'll download that malicious software. But when you get that malicious software on your computer, when it runs, what it does is it encrypts the important files on your computer. And then for you to get the key to unencrypt or decrypt that data, you'll have to pay. That's called ransomware. And it really kicked off in 2000 and probably 2012. And ransomware monetized previously bad behavior that really was kind of a nuisance, but it wasn't a tremendous problem. This is a big deal on the landscape right now. The entire school system in the state of Louisiana, the municipal systems in Atlanta, the municipal systems in Los Angeles were all attacked by ransomware and they had to pay between 300,000 and several million dollars to get the key to unencrypt their data and go on with the business of a school or the business of a city. So this is a, this is a current acute impact and the goal of computer security is to prevent that. The last one that we'll talk about is imagine you imagine yourself walking onto the floor of a hospital. Doesn't matter which hospital, doesn't matter which ward. But as you look around, you'll notice there is no enterprise that is it that is as dependent on computing and networking as hospitals. So they are ripe with targets for hackers. And an example that you see here in the image at the right, you can see there's a there's an x-ray. You can see the pacemaker that was put into the, to the human. That pacemaker is a little computer that monitors the sinus rhythm, rhythm of the heart. If the sinus rhythm of the heart is interrupted, then the pacemaker will induce a small shock to the heart to introduce it back into the normal ry rhythm. Well, that pacemaker is a computer, and it gets updates just like your computer on your desktop. And if it gets updates, those updates are available to people who should be updating it and people who shouldn't be updating the hacker that you can see sitting on the image. So there are about 400, as you can see in the, in the picture now, there's 400,000 devices that people have, human people, I mean, live people have those devices in their, in their body. And those were vulnerable to a hacking attack. Nobody actually exploited this hacking attack. 
but the ease of making it happen was astounding. So these are examples that that we want to prevent with computer security. So so there's a lot to it. You have to be the best the best recommendation I can give for anybody in computing, and certainly for anybody in computer security, is you have to be able you have to be willing to outwork everybody. And you have to be curious. So I want to invite you to shape the role, to take a role in shaping the future. So here we are in today over on the left-hand side. You can see a desktop. You can see all that network mobile devices. Now that picture at the bottom left is a drone that brings blood and medical supplies to remote regions in, in Africa. So instead of going on your phone and ordering up something to be delivered on Amazon, in this country, you go on your phone and you select which type of medical um, drugs and pharmacy that you want, or also blood, and then 20 minutes later, a drone comes over the horizon and drops it off. So that's where we are today. And in the middle, we have you, somebody who's willing to work hard, someone who's willing to be curious, someone who's willing to communicate with their team and their community and make things, make changes. And then on the right-hand side, everybody does an art, a, an identifiably bad job at predicting the future. If you go back and you look five years before, five years in the past, and you look till now, we just don't do a very good job. That's not a bad thing against us. It's just that we have this nonlinear system of behavior that keeps keeps growing in wonderful ways, but they're unpredictable ways. Our reliance as a as a nation, as a state, as a as a world, as a collective community in the world, is upon you to use your best intelligence, your best compassion, and your best analysis and decision-making to influence your communities. So these are areas you can work in. So you can model ecolog ecological change. We have computers now that allow people who were previously blind to see green technology we talked about for distribution of power. And you know, a special area is not all areas of the United States offer access to communities, social opportunities, and educational opportunities. And in some areas, particularly for women, there's some areas they don't have access to education. Well, online opp opportunities is a game changer for that. And then obviously the last one, instructional technology in the classroom. Well, that's that's the uh, educational change that just, just rippled through our entire system, both in K through 12 and then higher education. So, so I wanna change our focus now from talking about specifically why you would want to go into computing to what we offer here at CTC. So what I want to do is ignite your interest and then offer some paths for you to go through. And then we'll come back to this slide and we'll talk about some considerations of class in the fall. So I want to talk off, start off with uh, programs of study for the computer information and technology systems. So here's the website here at CTC. So the website that you're seeing is for for this major, for this area. And we divide our programs of study into two things. So at, at a community college, you either attain a degree or you attain a certificate. The degree is to provide you a two-year degree, either an associate of science or an associate of applied science. And that can be your terminal degree, or you can move to a four-year school after that. So that's one of the questions you need to know. If I'm getting a two-year degree, where can I transfer to? And in addition to, to degrees, we also have certificates. And you can see the certificate. So a certificate is typically a more focused study sequence that, that maybe doesn't have all the general ed that a, that a degree would have, and, but it has the same content area. So let's speak to these. So we have four, four programs of study, and you can see the, the, um, the certificates are similar to the programs of study. They're, they're just generally subsets of it. So we have computer science, and computer science is the transfer program. You, you take the computer science to your degree, and then you transfer to a gaining four-year school. So if you want to go to University of Texas, if you want to go to Texas A&M, you want to go to Mary Hardin Baylor, take that computer science. If you want to go to Texas A&M Central Texas down the street, take that computer science, associate of science. And that will focus on the software development skills, the programming skills. And it's a solid foundation that's recognized by the state and, and every, every community college and state offers that. We also have cyber defense and information assurance. That's the, that's the cybersecurity degree. And that gives you the skill set to compete and work in the, in the fields that we talked about in the prior slides just a second ago. And then we have two, two other 
degrees, information technology, and network systems. So network systems, they, they have a lot of overlap. So this whole field is a very, very network field. So there's a lot of similarity between the classes. But the difference between information technology and network systems administrator is the network systems administrator focuses more on the design of networks, the configuration of servers. So, so they're, they're common, but they have about 30% difference. So if you have, and we also focus on um, when you get to the end of your two-year degree, then we want you to consider uh, selecting an internship. Um, and that's something you don't need to necessarily worry about now, but as you get to the one-year point in your degree, in your two-year degree, that's something we ask you to focus on and think about and work on diligently because that's a significant competitive advantage. Okay, so I have a question here. It says, how do, I how do we practice what we learn in class and how can I get a job after, after I finish my major, finish your classes? Okay, so we'll talk about, we'll t take those in two ways. Um, let me see if I could bring up a quick, so I'm gonna divert from my presentation here for a second. So one of the things you clearly want to do is get into class. Let me see if I can get a diagram here. Um, kind of bear with me here. Okay, here's a good example. So let me see if I can pull that up by itself so it doesn't distract us. No. Okay, so I want you to focus on this box at the upper right. So the bottom line is, and this is, some, this is an important takeaway from this presentation and it applies to all majors. I want, I want you to get a good job. And that good job comes from three things. That good job comes from your degree, your skill set, and your professional skills to include internships. So your degree is, the, and realize the college is just one of those three things. So definitely get your courses, do well in your courses, take every advantage that you have of your professors, your office hours, your research, your library, your other professors, and your classes. That's, your, that's the foundation and that's the important thing. But I wanna be very clear to you, if all you do is attend classes and you complete a degree, when you finish, you're, you're not gonna get a job because you haven't, you haven't made yourself the most competitive employee and professional that you can. So get your degree, do very well in your classes. Let's stipulate that you've done that. The second thing that you need to do is you need to build your skills. And the way that you build your skills matters on the degree that you're in. Obviously, if you're in a healthcare field, your, your skills are clinical and you need, to get into the, you need to get into the hospital or the provider organization. In computing, what you wanna do is you wanna build operating systems and you wanna work with different computers. And then the third thing is your professional skill set. So how do you communicate? How do you write? How do you, how do you research? If I give you a problem, what's your, do you have a logical process to doing that? Now, it's really important that you know as you approach the end of your degree program that you focus equally on your skills and your professional skill set, not just your degree. So I want to stipulate that to you. There's a lot of students that are frustrated. They get a degree, they graduate, and they don't get a, they're not hired. That's not a surprise. That's something I want you to take on your responsibility now is what skills can I build up as I go through my program? So an example that I say here is, and um, one of the things I want you to know is there's, there's a lot to this, but you have the ability on your computer at home to do a great deal of lab work. And that, that, compu and that computer can't be, a, can't be a Chromebook or it can't be a Microsoft Surface Pro, but if it's a strong desktop, you can do a lot of things. So let's go back to this picture here. So in this picture, so we have this, this server, this big thing is, the big thing at the bottom is a server, a, or, I'm sorry, it's a, a shared storage. You have three servers at the bottom. And what the three servers allow you to do is notice you have different operating systems on this server, different operating systems on this server, different operating systems on this server. So this might be um, a Windows server that you can install and configure. And a Windows server is what allows you to log on when you go to school and you type in your username and password, your Windows server allows you to log on. So the question, how do you practice what you learn in class? If you have access to the campus, you go to the campus and use the resources there. If you don't have access to the campus, which is a really, you know, which is a limitation we have to all acknowledge now, 
in computing, you can access almost everything you need. And that's going to be a function of talking to your professor and seeing what they can offer you for that specific class to build up your skill set. And it is different even now than it was two or three years ago. What you have, what you have access to is incredibly different. It's powerful. I mean, it's different in a good way. Now, the second question that popped up in the chat, so if you're, if you're online, now take a look at the chat. The second one is, how can you get a job after you finish your classes? I'm going to ask you to retool that question because if you think about getting a job after you finish your classes, you're too late. You're late by about a year or you're late by about a, a year and a half. So the question that you need to think about is, as you start to approach one year from your graduation, you need to move yourself from the primarily academic world to the primarily skill set professional development world. And all these skill sets will not come to you from the, your classes. And all these professional developments will not come to you from your classes. You have to take responsibility to develop yourself in a way that's much more, much more has a larger landscape of skill sets than just your classes. So the three things, do well in your classes, build your skills and develop your professional capabilities. And professional capabilities are something that can be developed by anybody, anytime. You can speak to somebody. You can, if you help a neighbor with their cybersecurity challenges, maybe just help them install an antivirus. You know, they have a, some students that go out and help some of the senior citizens in the community install, um, install, make their computers more secure, which is very important. Uh, so they're they're gaining professional skills in that they're learning how to communicate, they're learning how to satisfy customers, they're learning how to solve a problem. So, so if you have any other questions, put them in the Put them in the chat. Obviously, if you send me an email anytime, we can set up a Zoom and we can talk this further. Another question came in from Spencer. How do we go about finding our internships? Well, that that's a campaign. And when I want to talk about internships, I'm primarily talking about paid internships. So in the terms of a priority, I would say get a paid internship or an apprenticeship. If those aren't available or you can't get those for whatever reason, then you, you can almost construct your own internship and you can provide somebody to mentor you in the community or somebody on campus but the way that you get those is you start a campaign of searching you know work with your faculty member go online talk about it internships but begin a campaign a year before you graduate about identifying an internship there may be no association at all with that internship in college i mean there may there, there may be an internship that's totally separate from ctc there may be internships that are part of a class at CTC, or there may be internships where you're working as a student at CTC. So the internships are not a clearly defined box that says, this is this internship, this is how it works. There are internships, if, you're, if you wanna be a software developer and you wanna be a computer science major, there are summer internships, there are hundreds, there are thousands of them, and they're, they almost all work the same way. They're very selection, they're very, um, competitive for selection, but you can you can be competitive. So what I ask my students in the fall of their final year is they need to apply for 50 internships in the fall, three internships every week until they get an internship. And they've been pretty successful. Some of them get a couple of internships. Some of them haven't been successful, but that's something they need to try. But bottom line is talk to me, talk to, talk to my peer faculty, and they all have some good recommendations. Okay, so what I want to do is transition now to um, class offering. So fall 2020, we're in the midst of COVID, life is different. When you take classes in computing at CTC, you'll take them in one of two modes. So you'll take them as synchronous online or online, and they're, they're similar enough to be confusing. So an online class is where you are mentored through, an, through a body of knowledge that represents the topic of your course. So if you're learning about servers, you'll be mentored to work through a course that focuses on servers. And you pretty much can set your efforts each week on what you want to do. You don't have to meet with the professor. That's the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. A synchronous online means there are one or two, maybe three scheduled sessions each week for about an hour where you'll meet online with the professor using some type of a WebEx or some type of Zoom. In an only online class, you'll migrate through the material at a measured rate mentored by the professor, but you pretty much have the liberty to schedule your attention during the week. Now the question becomes, which one do you wanna do? 
when you want to absolutely rock in learning, it's not a, when you rock in learning, it's not an, an individual experience. It's not a solitary experience. We thrive, we do well, we progress, we compete based on working with each other. So I would offer you this. If you're taking an online class and you have very little interaction with the professor or very little interaction with your peers, you need to change your method. And I, and I mean that you need to change it aggressively. So if you take an online class and you migrate through all those classes and you get a degree and all you've ever done is take the classes, you'll, miss, you'll have missed the collective growth that you get from working on a team or working more closely with the professor. So, so I want you to, you can make a synchronous online class absolutely rock. You can make an online class absolutely rock, but you have to take responsibility for you, for yourself and what you're gonna, what you're gonna learn. The very best student I ever had in any of my classes, both undergraduate and graduate, and I mean, she was incredible, was a lady who was, it was a mother. She was about 150 miles from our campus. She had two children. She was living in a remote area. She had a good internet connection, but she couldn't find a, she couldn't find a babysitter and she also couldn't afford the time it took to drive to campus. So all of her classes and all of her degree program was all online. And in her case, it was not, it was regular online. It wasn't synchronous online. And she was a stellar student. She did everything she could. We, we almost met one or two or three times a week, just her and I, and she got an online, uh, an online internship. It's, it, was, it was a paid internship. So she works as a software developer now. She's still at her house. She's still with her kids and she's still in a rural area, but she's working as a software developer. And she's probably, frankly, she's probably making quite a bit more money than me. So the difference is not what the school offers to you. The difference is how well are you going to get engaged? Okay, let's hit the third one there. So labs are available. So as I, as I mentioned just a second ago, almost everything you can do with a computer is replicable on a capable desktop. Um, you know, certainly the software development is part, but you can build a network on your, soft, on your desktop using something like uh, Packet Tracer, some of the... Some of the um, the Cisco tools. You can build a server on your desktop using virtualization. And some of these terms, if they're not clear, will become clear in the class. But the bottom line is everything that you need in, in the computing major, you can get from home. And so don't not do something because you're thinking, I'm going to go to campus and do it. As a matter of fact, if you can do it from home, now you don't have to drive there and back. You don't have to park. You don't have to walk in. I would recommend that you spend the time head down learning than maybe com com computing or commuting. So now one, one point I want to speak to you a little bit. A lot of people are frustrated with, you know, I, want, I really want to go to school. I really want to go into class. I really want to sit, sit in the class and I learn in the conventional way. And I agree. I love being in a classroom with motivated students, with students that are excited about learning, that have questions, that get frustrated, that have that their code doesn't work or their, their network devices aren't communicating. I get it. But I also want you to realize there's a there's a hidden a, a hidden gift in this environment that we have right now, and the gift is this: um, most people in the United States, in the workforce, when it comes time to learn, they're not sent back to a college again. They're not sent back to a university course again. They are given some type of access to a distance learning tool. So, for example, let's say you're a bookkeeper and you need to learn a new, a new law. Well, that new law will be presented to you through an online class. Or if you're a, uh, if you're a, uh, a jet mechanic and you need to learn how to do no, a new non-destructive inspection technique, you're not going to go to school to do that. that. That's rare nowadays. They're going to put you in an online class. So I want you to look at your efforts in fall 2020 as a way it's about you, and I want you to make your skill set better so that when you get into the workforce, you are able to rock from online presentations. Now, remember, everybody, everybody gets frustrated, and I do too, that, oh, I wish I could go online. I, wish, I mean, I'm sorry, I wish I could go on campus. That's the way I learned all the time. Well, that's a short interval in your professional development. Your on-campus time is four years. Once you move into the workforce, you'll probably work from your 22 to your 70. So that's 48 years. So for 48 years, you're probably going to be learning online or through some type of virtual augmented virtual reality. 
And for four years, you'll learn how to, you, you learn in college. So I want you to look at college as a, as a very compressed time of learning that's not the way you're going to learn for the rest of your life. So what you want to do is you want to, you want to develop the skill sets to power yourself to, and there's tools to do this. You don't need to go on, go off on your own and say, hmm, I wonder, I wonder how Professor Welch wants me to do this. There are, there are defined research behaviors that will allow you, allow you to be tremendously successful in your study. You can do those and you'll be successful. You cannot do those and it's quite likely you won't be successful. So learn about those and embody those as you engage with your, with your fall class offerings. Build a study group with your team. If, you, if you're in a major, get on, get on Zoom, you know, use some of the network, to, network applications that we have right now. Don't, don't turn it into a social time, although that's, has a, that has an important component. But work with each other to propel each other's success. Thanks for the time on listening to that. So some of this we already talked to. I just kind of direct your attention to the, to the um, plan early. So let's look at the middle bullet. You want, to be, you want to be successful in your education. You want to take responsibility for engineering the pathway of your education. Now, let's talk about what that means. While you're at a two-year college, you need to get the courses that you need in a timely manner. Because if it takes too long, you're the one that pays for it. Don't let that happen to you. So you should know, and, and CTC has a phenomenal um, student course planning system where it tells you what you need. And then as you complete them and pass them, it'll turn green. It's really cool. And you'll see that when you get into admissions and records or student services. As important or more important, as soon as you know that you want to transfer to a four-year school, you need to talk to a, a counselor or a, an advisor at the four-year school and ask them if all your courses transfer and if there's any other courses that you need to take to make the transfer go well. That's really important, and a lot of people don't think about that till just before they transfer. So once you know where you're going to go, that's where you can have the conversation. And if you don't know where you're going to transfer to, that's your homework. Start, start nailing that down and uh, talking to people about that. So bottom line is anybody can su succeed in computing. You just have to be able to outwork everybody and you need to be creative and be, be um, curious. It's an excellent career. You'll move through different positions in your career. I mean, my time in computing, I spent it, what have I done in computing? I spent time in computing, learning how to write, this is a little bit boring, load analysis programs for bridges and airplanes, which was very interesting to me, but it wasn't interesting to a lot of other people. I also learned it, how to write programs to optimize satellite orbits, which is pretty incredible. And then I learned about networking and the power of networking and bringing people into the education field and then cybersecurity, and I work, do a lot of work in the cybersecurity area right now. So it's an excellent career. It's not a job that you do and you stay in that job forever. It's a job that you do. You mature, you develop your professional skills, you interview, you compete, and you move, and you iterate that over time. And that probably will happen, you know, maybe 15 or 20 times. So that's it. I'm open to questions at any time. Um, so I have another question that came in is, what's a good resource for a network security person. Um, Marchette, let me ask you to do this. So, so I have some really good resources about entering the, in, the information security field. If you send me an email, I'll send you a link, I'll send you a list of them, but it really comes down to this. Enroll in a degree program in, in cybersecurity, particularly for cybersecurity. While you're in your degree program, I want you to compete in cybersecurity challenges. So a, an example of a cybersecurity challenge is they'll give you a, a PC and they'll ask you to break into it. And the purpose of breaking into it is to emulate what a hacker would do so you know how to defend against the hacker. There's also computer security competitions where you set up a network and then people will assess your network to see if it was secure. But the bottom line is, while you're taking your classes, also participate in these competitions. And we're in an era right now where these competitions run continuously. You don't, please don't think you need to do everything, but what you do focus on, you need to do well. So when you do a competition, prepare for it, narrow in on it, enjoy it. There'll be things that you don't know. I mean, I, I'm in competitions all the time. I'm very comfortable with all the material I don't know. Um, but 
but do the competitions. It'll let you know how you stand and it'll give you, frankly, it'll give you a better sense of where you are in the profession than your, than your degrees, I'm, I'm sorry, than your grades in your classes. Um, and then also get on a good mailing list. I have a couple good mailing lists I would suggest you get on. And what you do is you just get a couple of emails a week. It'll tell you, it'll give you the lay of the landscape and information security. It'll talk about certifications. It'll talk about scholarships um, and, then, and then take action as it, as it applies to you. But bottom line, stay in touch with me. And I think you're, I think you're on my mailing list now. So if there's any other questions, let me know. You, you, my email is available on the CTC site. And uh, have a good day. Thank you for the time. I appreciate it.